title of the lecture today is The City and the Enlightenment. This looks very pleasant, so I think I'm going to use it. Um, anybody want to join me? We'll have, um, the, um, the Enlightenment is um, one of these things, it's a term like Renaissance, where the people who were involved were not um, using that term. It's a term that is applied after the fact. And it refers to a period between the late 1600s and the early 1800s um, that is associated with uh, science and with um, sort of changes in political systems, the French Revolution, uh, the uh, American War of Independence could all be considered sort of outcomes or products of this period of Enlightenment thought. And uh, it, um, it, it's very broad, and so it's, it's elusive. But um, I would say that if you had to characterize it by one facet, it would be skepticism, the sort of, um, the sort of skeptic, skepticism that is embedded within scientific method, right? I have a theory. I have a, uh, a hypothesis. I will... Uh, create a series of experiments to determine whether or not um, my hypothesis is true. Um, I have to tell a story on my wife because I think it's cute, although she would kill me um, if she knew I was going to tell you this story. But since none of you know her, I will tell it anyway. Um, when her parents, both dead now, but when her parents were quite old, we had to move them from the house that uh, they had lived in for a very long time down in Savannah. And um, so I was moving boxes of stuff, and the top popped open of one box. And in it was a, a schoolwork that my mother-in-law had saved uh, from when my wife was, um, you know, grammar school, middle school, high school, that sort of thing. And on top was, um, on top was a green sort of a notebook, you know, a paper binder that um, said something of science, you know. And obviously they had been studying the scientific method. I think she was in the seventh or eighth grade. And um, the hypothesis, so I opened it up and it said, number one, one page, hypothesis, the earth rotates on its axis. I went to page two and it said uh, equipment. Uh, nothing about the method of um, trying to actually prove this or not, but just that equipment, a ball, a string, and a stick. And I turned it to page three, and it said, conclusion, the earth rotates on its axis. <laughs> um, my wife was not a scientist, but, um, but, but sort of embedded within the notion of scientific, uh, scientific method, um, which obviously she did not understand, um, at least not in the eighth grade, uh, is the notion of skepticism, that, that we don't know this to be true unless we can demonstrate it and then we can repeat it or someone else can repeat it independently from us, right? We might hypothesize that it is possible to create um, nuclear fusion uh, in a mason jar, right? Uh, as some people at Georgia Tech did a number of years ago, um, and got in a lot of trouble because nobody else could repeat this, uh, the results of this experiment. So they thought that they had, in fact, um, perhaps rigged the outcome. Um, I think that's very important. I mean, if you look, and this happens in political situations all the time. Uh, if you listen to people when they make arguments about things, um, they often will only use the facts that support their argument right? Whatever it is. And that's really the opposite of skepticism, right, uh, as a sort of honored uh, tradition. You want to uh, look at all the evidence and then sort of draw a conclusion based upon that evidence. Our system, uh, our judicial system, which guarantees uh, the right to a trial by a jury of your peers, um, it's divided into two parts, criminal, which is uh, murder, for example, which would be a crime against the state, 
and civil, which is uh, from old Roman tort law, which is um, I run into Jennifer in the parking lot out here, and therefore it's a civil action, right? My tree falls on my neighbor's house. That's a civil action, right? Property law deals with civil action as opposed to criminal. And I mention those, that distinction because in criminal cases, the, um, the standard is that it must be, um, the jury must conclude unanimously beyond a reasonable doubt. Whereas in civil cases, the standard is the preponderance of the evidence suggests. It's a much lower standard, right? There's a difference between preponderance of evidence um, you sort of put all the evidence up on the scale, and the scale does this, then you say, well, the preponderance of the evidence suggests that this is heavier, right? Um, and, of course, uh, scientific method is not very useful for things that um, can only be uh, evaluated uh, subjectively. And if you go back and read a lot of the sort of, particularly the aesthetic philosophy of the, uh, that is, of the world as perceived through the senses of the 18th century, you will see attempts, in fact, to sort of objectify what is essentially subjective experience. There's still a lot of this around. I mean, um, I saw a paper once at a conference where some people at um, a university and a school of architecture were trying to study hospital rooms to see uh, if the sort of color of the walls and the paintings that were on the walls improved the time of healing. And um, so <laughs> I got tickled because this woman puts up a picture, you know, Edward Munch, you know, the, the artist, the scream, you know this painting? This person, ah! And they put the painting on the wall, people are sort of in the ICU unit, they kind of come around, they've been in a coma, and they wake up and they see this guy screaming, you know, and guess what? They didn't like that. But, you know, if it was Yosemite Valley with bluebirds, you know, um, it was much better. And somehow they concluded that you were able to shave 1.73 hours off of recovery time if you had pictures of bluebirds rather than Edward Munch's The Scream. Duh. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, but the same kind of thing. I mean, there, there are some evidence coming out of um, Virginia and Connecticut uh, on the Iowa test of basic skills, which every grammar school student in the United States takes at third grade and at fifth grade, I believe. And um, that even when you control for things like uh, um, income and uh, ethnicity and parental background and all kinds of things, there is a differential in those scores of about eight points, eight to ten points better if the, if the room in which the test was taken had a certain amount of natural light and a certain indoor air quality. So it's an attempt to sort of create evidence that, in fact, there is a positive correlation between the environment of the room and learning. And, of course, if you're an architect, that's good news, uh, unless you're the one that's designed the room that everybody's getting low scores in, right? Uh, but that sort of thing is, is, is useful, and it comes from this kind of notion of the a belief in reason and a belief in um, a sort of method that has embedded within it what is, in fact, a quite honorable tradition, skepticism. Um, oh, I don't know that uh, it's true, right? Well, pick something that's controversial. Global warming. Is it true? Well, I don't know. We need to collect enough data so that we can then find out, right? So um, the, this, this, all of this way of thinking is something which is sort of characterized by the Enlightenment. And when you get into this, you don't get very far until you sort of come into faith versus reason, right? It, it becomes quite difficult. I've always said that Thomas Aquinas, the medieval uh, monk philosopher, had an advantage over us and that he knew what light was. We don't. Right? For Thomas Aquinas, light was an emanation from God. Right? But in our skeptical way of thinking, we say, well, yeah, but it must have some physical properties. It behaves both as a particle and as a wave. 
but it can't be both a particle and a wave. It has to be one or the other by the laws of physics as we understand them, right? And so you constantly sort of try to try to work and tease this stuff out. So the point is, between faith and reason, very quickly you run into uh, some difficulty. And um, this, um, this period, so we're just going to say it's the 18th century for the sake of um, um, th th several new things come into play at this point. And um, so before we actually get into the impact, it will have an impact on cities, but before we get into that uh, impact, I want to talk about one of these things that develops, and that is the invention of landscape. Now, this is a word that does not even come into use in English until the late 17th and early 18th centuries. It doesn't exist. Right? Um, I was reading um, a translation of the letters of Pliny the Younger about 15 years ago, specifically Book 5, Letter 6 to Demetrius Apollinaris. It was a description of Pliny's Tuscan villa. And in the translation, the English translation, it said that um, when I uh, walk out on my terrace, basically, the view before me is such a landscape. And I said, being something's wrong. Because that word, if you can look it up in your dictionaries, you'll see that it, in fact, is not it's entirely a product of this period. Um, so I went to the Latin, to a Latin copy of it. The Loeb series has Latin on one side and English on the other. And I went through the text and I found it. And you know what the word was that she was translating as landscape? What does carta mean? It's very close in Spanish. Map. It means a map. It looked like a map. It didn't look like a landscape. It looked like a map, right? It's a different thing. In fact, in um, Italian and um, French, for example, today, um, there, there is no equivalent word. Um, it's, um, there's a close word. In French, it's paysage, which means countryside, or in Italian, passaggio, which means countryside. But it is not the same. Countryside uh, is not the same as landscape. If I said, I am a countryside architect, what does that connote? That I'm out on a farm somewhere sort of arranging barns and cattle or something, right? Whereas in designing barns. Whereas if I said I'm a landscape architect, then obviously what would come to mind would be, say, the plaza in front of this building. Um, well, obviously there is no landscape architecture because there is no landscape uh, there were trees and mountains and rivers and things, but there was no nothing that we sort of collectively called this uh, until um, until this period, until around 1700. Now, the word, just so you know, this won't be in any test, but it's a it's a Celtic word, land, and that is a German word, scape. Uh, the word in German is actually shaft, and it has a related word, ship. In English, not a ship that sails in the ocean, but ship as in friendship, right? A collective, a collective thing. Um, the German word for this is Landschaften, and the Celtic word land, which may be the oldest word in continuous use in English today, um, actually means the interval between two furrows in a plowed field it was a land. Those of you who were anybody here in the army. Gosh, isn't that amazing? Um, usually I get a bunch of hands. If you are familiar with rifles, the rifling in a barrel, the interval of that rifling is called a land. If you're in Scotland, the divisions of an apartment building is called a land, right? So it's interesting that these, these uh, countries that uh, come up out of this kind of northern European Germanic tradition um, still have land often in their name, in the actual name, Deutschland. Uh, they don't call themselves German. Uh, we do that. Uh, we use the Latin term for it. The French it is Allemagne, and the Germans call themselves Deutsch. So it's Deutschland, right? Holland, 
England, Scotland, Ireland, um, Finland even, right, even though they are not within any uh, Indo-European tradition. Turkish and Finnish are very closely related languages. Anyway, um, landscape is invented, and it will have a profound impact on, um, on the way we begin to perceive the world and the way we perceive it then has an impact on how we conceive of it, uh, eventually how we make it materially. Now, the first thing in understanding this that's important is that um, today uh, we would tend to conflate uh, the term garden and landscape as being sort of somehow similar, when in fact, uh, if we really break it all down, they are polar opposites, 180 degrees apart. A garden is um, an enclosed, bounded space, and um, it is different from a landscape. Out beyond that garden, we see a landscape, but a garden is this, which is enclosed within a sort of bounded world. In fact, the word garden, guard, geared, uh, there's a Russian word, grad, gorod, uh, which like Petrograd, Leningrad, that actually means to enclose, and uh, the word geared, the Germanic root, garden, um, actually the emphasis is on the enclosure, not on, it's on the container, not on the contained. So with a garden, um, it's an objective architectural space. I am either in the garden or I am out of the garden, in the same way that I'm either in this room or I am out of this room, right? One or the other. It's an objective reality. Landscape is actually quite different. And um, the um, a landscape is um, formed in the mind's eye of the viewer. It may consist of either natural or man-made elements. Usually it is a combination of the two, natural and man-made. It has no material boundary. Rather, the boundary exists only in the mind of the person who sees it. So a landscape is brought into being through subjective experience. Now. There are two quotes I have. One is from the Christian theologian Augustine of Hippo, writing in the City of God in 429 A.D. Uh, in North Africa. And he says, I gathered those of like mind about me and withdrew into a garden given by my friend Valerius. From the profane world out here, I have withdrawn from that world into a garden. Right? Whereas Ralph Waldo Emerson says, the landscape I saw this morning undoubtedly consists of 20 or 30 farms. Smith owns this, Manning that, and Locke, the woodlot beyond. But there is property in the horizon reserved for he whose eyes can integrate all the parts. This is the best of these men's farms, and to this their warranty deeds hold no title. So the landscape here is, is um, the ability of the viewer to suppress the individuality of Manning and Smith and Locke and to see within it some collective condition that um, somehow elevates all of this above what their warranty deeds, their individual titles to property suggest. Well, let's think about this in terms of our constitutional order. Um, if the boundary is one of those four elements, what happens in landscape? Well, the boundary becomes vague. The boundary becomes indeterminate. It's dependent upon the subjective experience of a viewer. And as the architect of such, it depends upon my ability to replicate something so that you see it more or less the way I do, or experience it more or less the way I do. So to simplify this, or to attempt to simplify this, reduce it down, a garden is an objective architectural space, a landscape is brought into being through subjective experience, a view. Now, this will have um, some <coughs> fairly profound effects on cities. Um, again, you can think about that just in terms of the vagueness of what the boundaries are. Um, it requires, then, a redefinition of this word nature, which in the original Latin natura, the past participle of the word nace, to be born, nace, in French, I would say, je suis né à Paris, I was born in Paris. I would say in French, for me, je suis né 
uh, Atlanta. I was born in Atlanta. Um, natura meant the irreducible essence of something, as in what is the nature of the problem, right? For us, uh, post-enlightenment creatures, nature means anything not artificial, all that stuff out there. And it creates a lot of confusion, I think, because um, we tend then to say, we, we talk about this word, which is a very elusive and slippery word in which the way we use it already has a built-in kind of bias that um, causes us to think of the world and construct the world in a specific kind of way. Um, nature is man-made, and by that I mean it is a culturally conditioned term, right? If you go back and you read what the word Aristotle uses in Greek is physis, the physical, the physis. Um, and then there's the metaphysis, which travels alongside of it, um, which um, is the idea or the thought behind it. Now, um, what's embedded in all of this, though, is our relationship to the natural world. So, if we go to Versailles, which we've already seen, built out pretty much in the form you see here between 1661 and 1700, um, we have what I was taught is man's dominance over nature. And uh, I accepted that without question. Um, this great, this king, you know, with this great axis extending out from his bedroom out over um, the countryside here. The, um, <clears throat> but I always like to interject then this to say, well, um, and often I would put up uh, in a lecture such as this, uh, this photograph and put Versailles on the other screen and ask the rhetorical question, which one is more natural? And 99 people out of 100 will say this is. This is Stourhead in England built uh, between 1740 and 1780 by a man named Henry Hoare, H-O-A-R-E. Um, so I would then ask, well, why is this more natural than that? This has grass. That has grass, this has water, that has water, this has trees, that has trees, this has a bridge, architectural elements, this has fountains, architectural elements. So why would we, most people do you think, say this is more natural? I mean, what's the real difference here between this and this? What's obvious? This one has right angles. Ha-ha! Right angles. Orthogonal geometry. In the 18th century, in the Enlightenment, the assumption was that, as Horace Walpole wrote, um, William Hogarth wrote, nature abhors a straight line. We don't have straight lines in nature, do we? Or do we? I don't know. Um, the only real difference here is that this doesn't have any, uh, it is asymmetrical. It uh, doesn't have orthogonal geometry, but otherwise all the elements are the same. And I will tell you that the birds don't care whether they build a nest there or whether they build a nest here. Uh, the worms and grasshoppers don't care if they're living here. In fact, they might prefer it uh, to living here because every so often somebody comes along with a set of shears and clips that back. Uh, one difference um, that is not so obvious, just from the, but it is when you think about it, it's pretty hard to graze sheep here. But in the landscape garden, as it emerged, such as at Stourhead, um, sheep would be perfectly at home uh, out here in this pasture, wouldn't they? Right? In fact, a few cows might even add to its kind of rural simplicity. Well, what has happened here? What has happened is that this word nature has now come to mean uh, something quite different than what it meant before. Whereas um, here, you are pruning these trees to reveal their nature, the new red growth in the springtime, for example. Um, 
And the divine creator would never create anything that um, was imperfect. And therefore, platonic forms, circles, squares, triangles, were perfect forms, geometric forms, right? I mean, after all, we are made in his image and we are symmetrical, more or less, right? The Vitruvian man that we know of. All right. So um, for the people in the 17th century, this was as much about nature as, uh, whoops, as uh, this was. Now, if you're interested in all of this, I teach a whole course in it um, in the spring, uh, and I won't uh, sidetrack us today any further than necessary. I only need to point out this extraordinary difference which emerges on this uh, island, England, um, in the 18th century, and that will begin to affect cities in an extraordinary way. Now, interestingly enough, these are actually based upon paintings from the 17th century. This one by Claude Lorraine called Aeneas at Delos, and I've often thought this was the first true postmodern painting. <laughs> and I say that because um, here is Aeneas on his journeys from Troy, which apparently occurred sometime around 1120 to 1150 before the Common Era. And uh, here on the island of Delos, he encounters a pantheon, which was in Rome, not on Delos, and was built between 126 and 128 A.D. And uh, without Roman concrete, it would not have been possible to span that dome like that, create that dome like that. And then if we look out often here in the distance, we have sort of medieval ships and Gothic kind of buildings and other things. Um, a lighthouse or something out here. And then we see peasants crossing a bridge and some sheep and so forth uh, grazing in the meadows. These come to be known in the 18th century as landscape paintings, even though they are um, not called that when they are painted. They're called the paintings of the Italian school, um, of which a French painter, Claude Lorraine, was probably the best known. And, of course, why I'm going into all of this is that I believe that um, what I'm going to, over the next several lectures, the next few weeks, uh, the argument is, is that this will affect directly the conception of the city as we see it here in the 19th century in Paris from the Place de la Concorde up the Champs-Élysées, which was the great axis that under the note extended out of the, um, of the Jardin de Tuileries. Um, in the same way, this will influence our conception of cities such as this drawing that we see here. Does anyone recognize this drawing? Know who drew that? The Swiss French architect Le Corbusier, and it is an illustration of the city of tomorrow um, done for the Exposition Arts et Décoratifs in Paris in 1924. Okay? They're very different. Conception of the city here in the 19th century, conception of the city here in the 20th century. So this affects, the, you know, is drawn, affects this, which affects this, which affects this. This is Atlanta, Midtown, the view from Lake Clara Mere in Piedmont Park. And this photograph is on the cover of the American Institute of Architects Guide to Atlanta. I find that interesting, right? This view across the trees of these towers rising uh, in the distance. Compositionally, everything is asymmetrical. It's always either uh, 8 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The sun is always coming. Uh, usually in Lorraine paintings from the left, there's a foreground, a middle ground, a background, and this compositional style comes to be known as the picturesque, like a picture. Now, this plays out in cities in extraordinary ways, uh, and it's necessary to keep that sort of change, this invention of landscape, in the back of your mind as we go through this. Uh, the, there are three um, case studies that sort of that, you know, we'll use here. Uh, the first is Bath. Uh, that the reading uh, refers to. Uh, Bath is the old Roman town of Aquasullus, and um, it um, developed along the Avon River as a, uh, in the west of, of England um, as a 
uh, wool trading center in the Middle Ages with a small church, although it was not a cathedral. The bishop was down the road in Bath. Um, and we can still see the trace of a Cardo and Decumanus, and we can imagine then from what we know about the Roman city that the forum would have been somewhere in here, and it is not then following uh, often what we see. The church is actually built more or less in the site of the forum. Um, it was a kind of popular spa because there were springs that flowed forth that were very warm, uh, the, the heated by subterranean volcanic action coming out <coughs> at about 170 degrees Fahrenheit, very hot, it would burn you. Um, we still see fragments of the Roman wall here sort of repaired in the 19th century to look as the 19th century people thought a Roman wall ought to look. And a model of it that we see here, small town, all these sort of Roman streets, <coughs> which became very dirty, medieval streets, animal waste, human waste in the middle, no sidewalks, um, are now all sort of cleaned up because Bath is a sort of a resort town. Um, and it got that way actually in this period um, in the 18th century when it was sort of discovered that in fact it, it had a Roman origin and there was a tremendous amount of excitement uh, about this. Uh, this was bolstered by visits uh, by the Queen in 1702, 1703, who later built a house there. Um, she wanted to take in the water. And that led to Bath becoming a desirable spot for those among the wealthy of English society, so much so that the city appointed an official master of ceremonies. Now, how many of you in here have seen the thing on TV, Downton Abbey? One person? That's it? Two people? Well, you know, these, these English manors were out in the countryside, right? And there may be a village attached to it, but the village was, in fact, the working part. So these are the people that fed the horses and plowed the fields and fixed the carriages and, you know, made barrels or whatever. Um, well, if you were um, a young woman in your 20s um, or a young man who was going to inherit this estate, uh, how would you meet a suitable wife or husband? It's not like you can go down to the village blacksmith shop and say, you know, you're kind of cute, right? Because the, there's a different there's a structure, it's a very stratified society at this time, 1700, 1750. So um, Bath became this place where um, it was sort of the ultimate family-style singles bar, <coughs> where people would have these terrace houses that they would rent in the summer, and they would go there and then go to these parties so that the Duke of thus and such might meet the daughter of the Duke of this and that, right, or vice versa. And you would marry off your children to those among your peers. So um, it became then this great sort of center of social activity, <coughs> so much for that the city had to appoint an official Master of Ceremonies, a man named Bo Nash in 1704, sort of the social chairman of the sorority, so to speak, right, um, or the fraternity. As Bath developed as a social center, Ralph Allen, as far as I know, no relation to me, who owned a stone quarry, saw an opportunity to develop the surrounding land as speculative real estate for those in London who wanted to have a second home in Bath. Um, partnering with the Earl of Essex and a certain person named Mr. Gray, about whom we know very little, who owned the land just to the northwest of the medieval wall. Um, that was where Mr. Gray came in. He owned uh, this land uh, out here. Okay. In the meantime, Ralph Allen had contracted with the architect John Wood the Elder to design a series of terrace houses that could be combined into a single building with the facade facing onto a park similar to Bedford Square in London. Wood and Allen secured a 99-year ground lease in 1727, and construction began on the first of these, which was to be called Queen's Square. Now, 
What had prompted all of this was that they were making repairs uh, to a street, and um, they were sort of they hit rock, and as they were sort of trying to chisel through the rock, they were driving a rod, and the rod disappeared, ba boom, and then it went splash, and they all said, "What is that?" And they began to dig, and guess what it was? It was a Roman bath. This is the tepidarium. And what we see up to that point um, here is actually Roman construction. This that we see here, this is the 19th century addition when they created a pump house. And this whole area then began to be excavated, and this is what caused great excitement and why Queen Anne wanted to go out and take in the waters. They actually created something called the pump house, where they would all go and they would sort of drink this hot sulfuric water. Um, I've tasted it. It's absolutely awful. Uh, but they thought, you know, they were imbibing their Roman heritage or something at this point. So this is how this whole thing sort of developed. And then it led to, there we see it. This is the uh, pump house that we see here. There's the tepidarium. This is actually the frigidarium that we see here, the so-called king's bath. And uh, then there's this remodeled uh, street frontage that we see here. So the first of these, <coughs> Queen Square by John Wood the Elder, was a sort of suburb that was built just outside this medieval wall that we see here. And it is following the, um, it is developed in imitation of these West End squares that we've already talked about, residential squares in London, with this sort of uh, individually own townhouses that we see here that are unified by this neoclassical facade, all of which is facing out onto this um, amazing obelisk. John Wood had never seen a real obelisk. He had never been to Rome, although that did not stop him from writing a treatise on Roman architecture. Um, and so uh, he was taking this from engravings, and obviously he got the perspective wrong. He didn't really understand how these, how big these things were, and so therefore he tapered it, trying to increase the height. It's really kind of uh, silly looking as an object. Um, well, this was a great success. And uh, the success of Queen Square then led to an extension of this street that we see here, actually two streets, this street called Arundel Street, and then this street that we see up here going up to the circle uh, which was then to be based on the Roman Colosseum, uh, the Royal Circus, a series of terrace houses unified by a continuous facade based on Wood's uh, misbegotten interpretation of the Roman Colosseum. And there we see it. So you can see these are individual houses, but they're unified here by a common facade on this side. And then the... Um, there we see the party walls. And you could come and rent one of these things furnished uh, so that your son or your daughter could attend all these parties. This is what they actually look like in the back, a garden. And then um, this was very successful, and so they decided to extend it under a grant from the queen who gave some of her land to create the royal crescent. But John Wood, the elder, died about when the thing had gotten extended to right there, and his son took over, John Wood, the younger, who was a much better architect, actually. And there we see the whole assemblage uh, from the Royal Circus out to the Royal Crescent. And there we see it today. And uh, it looks like we're out of time, and so I will have to stop the lecture here and pick this up um, on Wednesday. Are there any questions about this? This conversion, this invention of landscape, I should mention, is very complex. And so I, I will only ask you in the context of this course to suspend your disbelief enough to say that uh, he, he thinks it's important enough to actually have gone through this and just accept not the reasons for it, but rather the, uh, the fact that it, it does develop. And because it does develop, it begins to affect how we build cities. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.